Hey everybody, well thank you so much for having me to be with you today. Um, that was quite an intro, I, I don't think I really deserve that, but it's so good to be with you. Uh, great to see you, whether you're here in the room with us this morning, whether you're online with us today, it's great to have you here. Honestly, um, Joel used a great expression actually, he said his heart is full, well my heart is full as well. I can't remember how long we've had this date in the diary, but it's been quite a long time, hasn't it? And I've been looking forward to it so much because um, Joel said lovely things about the Further Faster Network and about us, but it has been equally a joy to get to know Joel and Beth over these last few years and through them to find out about your church and all that you're doing. And uh, that has been similarly a, a delight for us. And when we get to hang out together and spend some time together with Joel and Beth, as I've had the chance to do oh, a couple of weeks ago when we were away together, um, it's just been so much fun. And uh, I haven't laughed so much for a long time. So I promise you, as much as uh, we are able to help you, you do the same for us. Absolutely, that's, that's true. And, and just, I, I'm going to say a little thing about the Further Faster Network before I get into the rest of the message today. Um, our Further Faster Network is a new thing. We started it from our church with four other churches uh, about uh, four or five years ago. We've been dreaming about it for a little while. And uh, it's been such an encouragement to us that churches like yours would come and be a part of it with this great dream we have of there being a church that thinks about and is inclusive of people who don't normally go to church in every community in the UK and Ireland. That's our big dream and our big vision. And uh, it's been so great that you've been sharing that with us and joining in uh, on that with us. And um, uh, I'm the senior pastor at Andover Baptist Church, but I've just uh, given up that for a day a week. So now a day a week, I get to work for the Further Faster Network, which is a great joy as well. So being able to see other churches and spend time with other uh, people leading churches is just such a great delight for me too. And a, a huge part of uh, my job these days, which I really get to love. So thank you. Thank you uh, for being a, a part of it. And thank you for encouraging other churches on this journey because uh, since your church joined, a whole load of other churches have joined. We've got 19 or 20 churches in the network now and uh, you are a great blessing to them. Again, whether you know it or not, you are a great blessing to them. <clears throat> Next week, for example, at our church, uh, we're starting a new series uh, called Lost and Found, which may be familiar to you because we've stolen all your stuff. Uh, and it's one of the great things that we're able to do as, as churches is share resources. And uh, Joel has been really kind in sharing that Lost and Found series with us. And so we're going to be uh, starting that next week at our church. So this is an example of the sorts of things that are going across, uh, uh, um, uh, happening across our network, which we absolutely love. So thank you so much for being a part of it. Um, when I was little, very little, we used to go and visit my grandma, and uh, my grandma used to love us going to visit, and she'd tell us when we arrived how she'd been up since five o'clock in the morning, peeling potatoes and doing veggies, because she used to like to do these enormous spreads of food uh, for us when we went to visit. And then come the afternoon, it was always the same, my grandma loved uh, snooker and wrestling, so come the afternoon when we had this enormous spread of food and everybody's tired and we're sitting uh, in the living room, she'd always have the telly on and it would either be on the snooker or the wrestling. Now, you have to be of a certain age, I understand that. You have to be of a certain age to remember Saturday afternoon wrestling on ITV World of Sport, some of you are nodding, uh, with famous, those, those amazing names of wrestling, I don't know whether you remember this, Giant Haystacks, anybody? Oh, you're my kind of crowd, this is great. Giant Haystacks, Big Daddies, anybody remember Big Daddies? And it was, it was like a total pantomime, right? It was all pre-organized and pre-rehearsed. But my grandma used to love it. Or she used to, to say that she loved it. But the noises that she made whilst it was going on always led us to kind of think, why is she watching this? Because she would go, ooh, and ah, and every time somebody was slammed to the canvas. She would always do all of that. And we weren't really sure whether she was enjoying it or not. But she used to love watching the wrestling on a Saturday afternoon. And I've been thinking recently, when I've been reflecting on the world in which we live these days and the culture in which we find ourselves, I've been thinking more and more about how we do conflict and actually how badly we do it these days. Because with the rise of social media and 24-hour uh, news and you know, all of that kind of stuff, clickbait, all of that sort of stuff, we're being encouraged, I think, and driven, I think, actually, into a place where we do conflict really, really badly. Where instead of wrestling with stuff together, we stand apart from one another and throw punches. And I've been thinking about this contrast between wrestling and boxing. Because you see, uh, I've got this picture in my mind of one of those sweaty old boxing gyms 
that maybe looks something like this, that you see in the movies or you see on uh, television, and you can uh, immediately, I think, when you see this kind of image, I- I'm picturing in my mind, and I'm hearing in my mind, sounds like the thud of boxing gloves on pads or on human flesh. I'm thinking about sweat kind of pouring off, and as somebody gets smacked, sweat flying as their head goes from one side to another. I'm thinking about those kind of images. And when I think about how we might do conflict better, I think about this contrast between wrestling and boxing. And it seems to me we are falling into this pattern when we come to disagree with one another. And it might not even be serious conflict. It might be simple disagreement in a relationship or or, or in family or with a work colleague or in school or wherever it might be. Our tendency these days, and I think where we're being driven to, is to stand apart from one another and try to land punches until eventually we knock somebody out. And actually, I think that stands in stark contrast to what goes on in wrestling. Now, wrestling, you you have to grapple with one another. Wrestling involves unity, actually. You have to kind of get in holds with one another. And I know you're trying to kind of struggle with one another, but it's done in intimate connection with one another. And I think there's something really important about that. And I think as we shall discover this morning, actually, God invites us to wrestle. He invites us to wrestle with one another, and he invites us to wrestle with him. And wrestling is a conflict that involves unity, togetherness, contact, and I think we're losing the art of wrestling. You know, in our relationships, just think about for a moment, whatever your relationships might look like, in our relationships, it's inevitable that we'll experience conflict because sometimes we disagree or we hold different views or different opinions. Or sometimes we face really sensitive moral dilemmas. We face these sometimes in church life. We face these in our culture and in our society. But how do we rediscover or at least not lose the art of doing conflict whilst maintaining kindness, togetherness, and unity, when all the time we're being pushed into confrontational argument and into doing disagreement and holding different opinions really badly. And it's true not only in our relationships, our personal relationships, but you see this at national and international level. You see this in governments. You see this when it comes to important decisions that people are making in democratic countries. You see how violently we disagree with each other. And instead of being able to hold that and wrestle with it together, we divide, we try to land punches, and we resort to name-calling and division. We call the person on the other side of a moral debate or an ethical dilemma bigoted, phobic, or worse. We call people with a different political opinion to us, fascist, communist, stupid. And what about the conflicts that rage inside of us too? Because we have conflicts going on inside of us, not just with other people or with big cultural things that are going on. What about those conflicts that are are raging inside of us to do with fear or anxiety or depression, or as Beth was encouraging us to think about earlier, what about those conflicts that rage inside of us because of our brokenness? How do we wrestle with those? And what about God? In the midst of our doubts and our questions about life, our suffering, our struggling, our wondering about the meaning of things, do we stand apart from the idea of God and throw punches, or do we wrestle Do we crave intimate contact with God and wrestling with him? Boxing involves separation, whereas wrestling involves grappling and contact and togetherness. Could there be something, and I'm certain that this is true, could there be something to be gained by wrestling rather than trying to throw punches? Could there be something to be gained instead of standing at a distance from one another or the person we disagree with? or even God when we're struggling with the storms of life, could there be something to be gained rather than standing separately from actually drawing closer into contact? And so I'm going to talk today about wrestling with God, but I know you're going to unpack some of these thoughts and ideas over the next few weeks in a series about wrestling with. And I think this is so, so important, and I commend it to you as as much as I possibly can, because I think... Our society and our culture in the Western world 
is heading and has already headed down this route of standing apart and trying to land punches. And for people, for a community of people like a church, for us in our relationships, in our family lives, for us to model this when we uh, uh, have disagreements politically or over those big moral and ethical dilemmas of the day, if we can model what it genuinely means to wrestle well, even when we disagree, then I think that speaks powerfully and prophetically into our culture. And actually, I think it'll bring us closer to God as well. So we're going to see what it means to wrestle with rather than box against, because wrestling with will help us grow closer to God and to one another. It's a skill that will make things better for all of us. And actually, this is true whether we're Christians or not, whether we're followers of Jesus or not. If you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're exploring faith, well, it's so great that you're here. And it's so great that Joel and Beth and their team are trying to create a church where you feel welcomed and valued and included, and I know that's on their heart. And so I hope that you'll continue to wrestle with the idea of God, even if you're not sure you believe in God yet. And I know because I know them that Joel and Beth and their team would love to help you on that journey. And I'm going to talk today about how we wrestle with God. So I think this is a great subject for you. Now, if you would say, well, I am a follower of Jesus, and maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for a really long time. Well, I am certain you have already or you will experience times in your life where God feels maybe far away or you feel far away from God. Times in your life where you're struggling or you're in pain or you're wondering why isn't God answering my prayer and indeed many of you may be in that situation even this morning. And again, you have a choice when those sorts of things happen. You can stand apart from God and you can rage and and demonstrate all of your treasure and you can try and land punches on God or you can draw in close to God and wrestle with him, even though he might not be giving you the answers that you want. And so that's why we wanted to start this series that you're doing, uh, uh, talking about wrestling with God. And I want to say right from the beginning, it's absolutely okay to wrestle with God. I think, and I hope as I speak about this, you might find that there is a surprising revelation here that we really weren't expecting. Not only is it okay to wrestle with God, But actually, well, I don't want to give away the surprise. So we'll crack on through. To find this revelation, we have to head back to the very, almost the very beginning of God's story and the story of the people of God. And if you're not familiar with this, let me just try and summarize this really, really quickly. So God creates all of humanity. God creates all of the universe, all of the world, our amazing planet. God creates... And then people decide to turn their backs on God, to live in rebellion against God. But God just can't bear that idea of people living in rebellion against God. But he has created us with free will. So God needs a plan. So God develops a rescue plan. And and basically, uh, when you look, if you you look at God's story in the Bible, the first uh, very few chapters are about that rebellion. And then the whole of the rest of the story is about God trying to draw people back. And it starts, God's plan starts with creating a people, the people of God, the people who become known as the people of Israel. And God says, I want to create this group of people to be a light to the world, to show the world what it looks like to live in relationship with me and to be a light to the nations. And God starts that with a couple called Abraham and Sarah, and they're going to be the parents of that nation. And their grandson was Jacob, and Jacob would play a pivotal role in this whole story of the people of God, because Jacob would have 12 sons who'd become the leaders of the 12 tribes um, of Israel. But before all of that happens, and there's the story of Joseph and his coat and all that kind of stuff, if you're familiar with all of that, but before all of that happens, Jacob has this really strange encounter with God. And I want to say from the outset, it is strange. And when you read the story, it is a little bit weird. But we're going to do our best to try and explain it this morning. And we read about that in the very first book of the Old Testament part of the Bible called Genesis. Genesis chapter 32. And it takes place when Jacob is on his way to meet his brother Esau. And uh, the text is going to come up on the screen behind me. I think if you're online, it's going to come up online. And uh, I'm going to read uh, various chunks of it and then pause because I just want to reflect on it as we go through. It says, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions, 
So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So all, all, all of Jacob's stuff and his family and all the people he's traveling with and all that kind of stuff, because this is a kind of a nomadic existence at this point, they've all gone uh, over the river, and Jacob is left and uh, isn't going to cross until the morning. And this already, this is a little bit weird, because Jacob's on his own, but then this strange man appears who wrestles with Jacob. But as we discover, as we read on through the story, this is actually more about a spiritual struggle than it is about a physical struggle. This is not just a man, and we'll discover this again a bit later on in the story. This is not just a man, but this is God that Jacob is wrestling with, that Jacob is struggling with. Other Bible passages later on in the story of God talk about this man being an angel. This is God. And whether this is an actual physical being or a metaphor is a debate we can have another time, but that's not really the heart of the story. This is a metaphor or an illustration of a spiritual struggle that is going on. It's not quite clear what's happening, but it is clear, and what will become clear is that Jacob is wrestling with God and the struggle is real. But also I just want you to notice from this that Jacob, we're told, Jacob was left alone. And uh, Joel, I think, said something about this in his uh, intro a little bit earlier. When we're alone, so often when the struggle is much more difficult, isn't it? When we're alone when we're missing out on relationship or missing out on community. That's often when our struggles happen. We were reflecting, so we were chatting over tea and coffee about COVID and how much time we had to spend on our own and how great it is to now to be able to be back in relationship and in community with other people. And I know we did our absolute best to make that happen online, but it wasn't quite the same, was it? When we're alone, it's often that our struggles happen. Our doubts and our fears and our worries are often more apparent. They often feel bigger to us. And that's why community is so important. That's why being part of a church family is so important. And again, I just want to say, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, but you're part of this church community, great job. Because actually, this church community, and I know their heart, would love to support and encourage you, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey. And actually, people in our society, in our culture these days, are craving community. And actually, often that's their first point of contact with churches. If we're trying to be churches that people who don't normally go to church love, being a welcoming and including community for those people is so important. And people can belong and feel that they have friends before and whilst they journey on discovering who Jesus is and who God is. That's why community is so important. So they're wrestling. Uh, Jacob and God and uh, this is a kind of a picture that we're seeing here of Jacob wrestling with God with his doubts his fears his anxieties and actually even more his selfishness his pride and his unwillingness to allow God to direct his life this is actually a story a wrestling match that's going on <clears throat> where Jacob is saying I don't want to submit control over my life to God I don't want God to have authority over my life and then actually, if we thought, well, maybe this is a little bit weird, well, it gets weirder. So we go to verse 25. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Cheating. Cheating is going on here now because this uh, wrestling match is going on and the, the man can't overcome Jacob, so he injures him. Now, when the text tells us here that Jacob's opponent cannot overcome him, it's not suggesting that Jacob is physically beating the man. The ease with which the man is able to inflict some physical damage on Jacob indicates that actually this is not a physical challenge. This is a spiritual challenge. Do you see that? You see, Jacob is initially unwilling to submit, unwilling to submit, unwilling to yield to the man. So the man appears to cheat, or at the very least grab Jacob's attention and forces him to stop and listen. I wonder, you know, if God does this sometimes with us too. God sometimes might allow us to feel or experience something that takes us out of our comfortable, easy life and that grabs our attention. I wonder if maybe God does that sometimes. I'm sure if, you've, if you are a Jesus follower and you've been a Jesus follower for a while, you can tell the stories 
of how actually some of the most profound moments in your life, some of the moments in your life where you felt closest to God, and certainly some of the moments in your life when you've grown in your relationship with God have been of some of the most uncomfortable moments in your life, where you've been taken out of what's comfortable, and you've had, therefore, to depend and rely so much more on God. So Jacob is taken out of where he is comfortable and he is taken into a place where he is going to become dependent on God. And then this, this is so cool, the next verse, verse 26. Then the man said, let me go for it is uh, daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now Jacob is wrestling with all of his pride and stubbornness and selfishness, his unwillingness to submit to God, but he is still able to say, and I think this is fascinating, will you bless me? Do you notice what Jacob says here? Jacob does not say, please take away my struggles. Jacob does not say, take away the pain of my wrenched hip. Jacob does not say, put it back in again, would you please? In fact, the opposite. Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob is craving the blessing of God, the presence of God, intimacy with God, relationship with God, more than he is craving release from the pain of his hip. I think that's really, really significant. You know, I don't know about you, but I often pray, oh God, release me from this. God, take me out of this uncomfortable situation. God, please do this, do that, do the other. And it's usually to do with God making my life more comfortable. What if instead... We started praying, God bless us. God bless me. You know, God, uh, Jacob didn't want to win his wrestling contest. He simply wanted to be blessed. And in our doubts and our fears and our anxieties and our worries, maybe what we need most of all is to encounter God, to be in the presence of God, to be blessed by God. And I think that's something deep and something extremely profound. And notice Jacob doesn't try to push God away and stand at a distance and start telling God, why did you do this? Why did you wrench my hip? Why isn't this going okay? Why am I alone? He didn't stand at a distance and try to land punches on God. He pressed in closer to God, maintained the wrestling with God, would not let God go. The man is saying, let me go. He said, no, no because Jacob is craving that blessing. And then look, and this is really important, I think, too, in the next couple of verses. Look what being blessed means. Because again, if you're, if you're a Christian, if you're a Jesus follower, I'm sure you've prayed this uh, over and over again. And, and I find myself, <clears throat> as a pastor, often saying to people, oh, bless you, oh, bless you, oh, bless you, or praying for God's blessing. Look what the blessing means in verse 27 and 28. It says, the man asked him, what is your name? <clears throat> Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. God changes Jacob's name. We'll come back to why that's so significant in a moment. God changes Jacob's name, but the blessing of God on Jacob will enable Jacob to do something really significant and important. He will become a father to nations, to, try, to the tribes of Israel. A blessing doesn't mean a warm and fuzzy feeling that we get to carry around with us on our own. The blessing of God means equipping by God to bless others. It's really important. But let's talk about this changing name thing, because this is really significant, because in Jacob's world and in Jacob's culture at the time, changing someone's name was a way to exert authority over a person. And Jacob accepts this name change, knowing full well what he's doing is he is submitting and yielding himself to God's authority and direction for his life. If he hadn't accepted that name change, that would have been him saying, no, I don't want you, God, to direct and guide my life, to have authority over my life. But when he says yes, he's accepting that God has authority over his life. And this is what the struggle had been about. This is what the struggle and the wrestle had been about. Jacob's, uh, God's desire was to wrestle with Jacob and actually, in that wrestling, to break Jacob's self-sufficiency, his pride, 
and his independence and instead to draw him back to the source of direction and power for his life. That's what this wrestling had been about. And Jacob finally, after wrestling all through the night with his stubbornness and his pride and his selfishness, he submits and yields to the power of God over his life. And this is such an important moment in Jacob's story, but actually in the story of the people of God, which becomes our story because we are birthed out of this people of God. And the name that God gives to Jacob is Israel, which means struggles with God and with humans and has overcome. Look, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Do you see? Jacob is now being reminded constantly through his name that he has wrestled with God. So this, again, we're just trying to get our heads around this for a moment. This is huge. This is amazing. This bunch of people, God's chosen people who would be birthed, first of all, from Abraham and Sarah, and then through Jacob, through the tribes of Israel, and so on. God's chosen people would be given the name Israel, which literally means to wrestle with God. This is our context and our history. And as I said, we, uh, now, we are birthed, the church is birthed out of the people of God. The one who saved the world, who we follow, Jesus, came from within the people of God. So this is our story. And our story is birthed in this idea of wrestling with God because from this group of people would come one man. And from that man, Jesus, would come Christianity and the church. And our foundations are in the people of Israel, which literally means to wrestle with God. Let's look just finally at the last couple of verses. Jacob says, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. So here's the kind of confirmation that this person that Jacob has been wrestling with was God because Jacob recognizes this man as God and that he has been wrestling with God and he even called the place Peniel which means face of God. I have come face to face with God. So big conclusion to draw from all of this. Wrestling with God is okay. Actually that's the foundation of our story. It's one of the ways that we grow. The foundations of the people of God are in wrestling. And so I want to encourage you, I want to encourage myself too, when we have doubts or fears or anxieties, or if you're in that place where you're exploring faith, not sure what you believe yet, if you're in that place today where God seems far away from you or you seem far away from God, or if you're going to face those moments as we all will later in our lives where things are a struggle and we're trying to work out where is God in the midst of all of this, it is absolutely okay to wrestle with God. In fact, God invites us to wrestle with him. He invites you to wrestle with him even if you don't know him yet in your exploration of faith, to ask those questions. But maybe you're conflicted in your heart of hearts right now because you're not a follower of Jesus and you know there should be something more to life, but you've got all these questions about if there is a God, why is this okay and that happening and why does this go on? Again, I want to encourage you to run towards God rather than run away from God. Rather than trying to keep him at arm's length and throw your punches and your questions about God, why don't you get connected with God and ask him your questions and wrestle with him? And if you are a Christian, maybe you've been one for a long time, bring God your doubts and your fears. Bring them to God rather than running away from God. Wrestle with God rather than separate yourself from God. Crave the blessing of a relationship with God. Crave the blessing of God's presence more than you crave an answer to every question. Now, I don't know whether this is me, and I don't know whether it's just because I'm getting older, so forgive me if, if it is. But the older I get, the more I'm comfortable with not knowing the answer to every question about God. And um, I try to tell my church this. And um, I try to not scare them too much, but they've got somebody leading them who doesn't have the answer to every question about God. But actually, I think that's much more authentic. Because I think this more and more these days, if me with my little mind and all the things I know I don't know, or don't know I don't know, 
if me with my little mind can get my mind around God in his entirety, what kind of God does that make him? Not a very big one. I want God to be bigger than I can imagine. I want God to be bigger than I can even get my head around. I want God to be bigger than all the ways I can answer all the questions that there might be about God. Because if I could do all of that, what kind of God does that make him? So I'm becoming more and more settled in my spirit these days that it's okay not to know the answers to everything. That Christ, the Christian faith is a mysterious thing. And that's okay. And I'm going to be okay with mystery in my 20s and in my 30s when I studied theology. In my arrogance of my youth, I wanted to work out the answer to every possible thing there was to know about God. Well, what a foolish quest that was. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't study those things and we shouldn't investigate things. Of course not. But actually, from a place of feeling settled that we will never know everything there is to know about God. We'll never know the answers to all the questions we have about God. I heard just yesterday a, such a sad story of a, a lady who'd been connected with our church. Her mum is in, in our church, and uh, this lady, her daughter, passed away at a very young age yesterday from cancer. I don't get that. I don't get that at all. But I crave wrestling with God the blessing of God, the presence of God in my life, more than I crave knowing the answers to all those questions. And I think it's okay when we're trying to comfort people in those situations in life to say to them, I don't know either. I don't know. I don't know why God's allowed this to happen. I don't know why God hasn't intervened in the way that we would want him to intervene. But I tell you what, having God with me, having God with you, praying for God's blessing upon you, in this situation and circumstance, wrestling with God throughout of all of that has got to be better than separating from God and not having the blessing and the peace and the comfort of God in life's d darkest circumstances. And here's, here's the other thing too. God is fighting for us. God is pursuing us. God is going after us. We can try to resist or we can press in See, I think the other thing that's interesting about the story is Jacob didn't start this fight. Jacob wasn't wrestling with God. God was wrestling with Jacob. God was pursuing him, seeking him, refusing to leave him in his selfishness and his pride and his sin, refusing to leave him in his doubt and in his fear. And just if I may, a little bit of technical Hebrew, so you can take this away with you this morning if you learn nothing else, a little bit of technical Hebrew. The, the, the Hebrew was the language in which this, the Genesis was written in. The phrase Israel, Israel actually is a phrase in which God is the subject. God is the subject. God was the initiator of the struggle with the people of God. So God is the initiator in the story. God is fighting for them before they ever knew it. God is going after them before they ever knew it. This is God-initiated stuff. God is seeking us, coming after us. And we are people whose nature is to struggle with God, to avoid becoming the people we could be. We're people who God continues to struggle with because he wants to take us there to the people he knows we could be. God, you ever thought about this? God sees so much more potential in you than you could ever imagine. And God asks you to wrestle with him so he can take you there. So if you're wrestling with God, that is more than okay. In fact, it's to be encouraged. But you need to know that God wants to wrestle with you too. God is pursuing you. He's encouraging you to yield to the purpose and direction he wants for your life. So, in our relationship with God, wherever that is, whatever that looks like for us right now, let's not stand back and try and land punches on God. Let's grapple with him. And actually, he's already coming to us. We just have to kind of open our arms and, I don't know what a wrestling hold's called, but, you know, engage. Let's crave the blessing of God more than anything else. And let's allow God to steer us through. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how amazing and wonderful and beautiful it is to know that, that the God we're going after here, that the, the God we're, we've been praising and worshipping together this morning, the God we believe in or we're uh, beginning to kind of get to know or beginning to <clears throat> explore, it's not a God who stands at arm's length and berates us or beats us or tries to land punches on us. 
our God is a God who wants to engage, press in, who is running after us, who is, is pursuing us, is reaching out to us and saying, come on in. And I know you've got questions and doubts and, 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 and things that are going on in your life which just makes it feel like I'm far away, but here I am. Press into me. God, I thank you that you are a God who longs to pour out blessing and presence upon us. And so, Lord God, this morning, in the midst of all the questions that we've got, maybe in our fears, our anxieties, our worries, our brokenness, we say, God, bless us. Bless us to be a blessing. Thank you that our roots are in a story like this, rooted in this idea of wrestling with you. Lord, forgive us for when we have stood apart and tried to land punches. Draw us now into your presence again, I pray. And for anybody here this morning who is in that place where life is just rubbish right now and they've got all these questions and doubts and worries about even where you are, I just want to pray that they would feel in that place today just to say, God, bless me. I push into you, not run away from you. I'm not going to do that anymore. And Lord, I pray that you'd pour out blessing on each and every one of us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, folks. It's been so great to be with you this morning. And uh, yeah, I look forward to catching up on the rest of the series.